Okay, right, certainly a, pr a privilege and a joy to be here, and uh, for the folks that have been working behind the scenes to organise it, a big, big thanks, and I'm sure the day will be a real help and a real blessing to every one of us. Uh, now, just to get our sort of minds thinking, first thing in a Saturday morning, we're normally kind of uh, quite dozy, I'm sure, at this time. So I just want to ask a question, if this comes up on the screen, should do it. You ready? What links these dates and places? Have you got a thing, a, a remote? There's there, there's one in front of you. Okay, so I'm just going to put a number of dates and places up on the screen and uh, we're just going to just think what links these together. What do all these places and all these dates have in common? Right, I know they're all in Ayrshire, you've probably got that. Um, they're dates from over a century ago, some of them over two centuries ago. But the big thing that all these places and dates have in common is this revival and awakening. If you go into your church history, the history of revivals, you'll discover that in these dates that flashed up on the screen, and in these places, God moved in a mighty way in revival. That God touched his people in these towns and in these villages in a remarkable way, in an unprecedented way. And God not only revived his church in these places, but God awakened these communities. I, I don't know about you, but the very word arrival, uh, revival, the word awakening, uh, just does something within my spirit. It stirs me. And it always has. I, I remember as a youngster, uh, just baptized in fellowship and just keen, uh, keen to serve the Lord, keen to see God move in the community where I lived. And I was desperate in these early days of my Christian experience, desperate just to see God moving in revival. I remember just as a teenager reading Leonard Ravenhill's book, Why Revival Tarries. You know, we, it's not organizers we need, it's agonizers and all these wee pithy statements that were, just so, uh, that were just so common to the ministry of Ravenhill. And, and I was fired up as a youngster for revival. And I remember in the church that I went to speaking about that and the cold water just been poured over that fire that was in my spirit. And I was told as a youngster that the days of revival were all past and this was a day of small things. And, you know, if you read your Bible, you'll discover that we're in the end times and there's no, there's, there's no possibility of God moving in revival. And although I get a wee bit sort of dampened in my spirit at that time, I'm thankful that time and time again, God just stirs me up again. And I believe, I believe that we are able to see God move in unprecedented, unprecedented ways in our towns, in our villages today. And I know there's young folks here today with a passion for revival. Don't let anybody dampen that passion, but take that passion into the presence of God and pour out that passion before him. And I believe that God will answer the passion of our hearts. I, I want just to think with you uh, for a few minutes this morning of the royal route to revival, the regal route to restoration, the route that God has laid down in his word, whereby we can really prove him and see him at work. Solomon built the temple. It's a magnificent structure. I remember a couple of years ago, we had a, a, a chap from Argentina, his name just slips me, and we had him for a week's meetings, or a few nights meetings in, in Auchinleck, and he had a model of Solomon's temple. An awesome thing. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. The architecture, architecture of this thing, uh, the, the amount of, of gold and silver and, uh, that was associated with that, a splendor, spectacular building that would have taken your breath away. 
years and years of work and preparation and sacrifice. But it was just an empty shell. It was just an empty building. People could have looked at it. They could have admired it. They could have stood in awe at it. But it was just an empty shell. And oftentimes, maybe our Christian lives are a wee bit like that. Maybe oftentimes our churches are a bit like that. And there's a lot of effort put into them. And a lot of energy. And a lot of sacrifice. And all looks good in the outside. But maybe inside. It's just an empty shell. An empty shell. And then Solomon prayed. Solomon prayed. That was what was going to make the difference. That was what was going to fill that shell. That was what was going to bring power into that building. That Solomon got on his knees and he prayed. He prayed. The fire was consuming and the glory was filling. The very priests couldn't even go into the temple. The people just fell down on their faces and the very pavements around it, overcome with a sense of the presence of the awesome, almighty God. Does that know what happened in Stuarton, 1625? Does that know what happened in the western seaboard of the United States? Is that not what happened in the, in the Western Islands just in the 1950s? When a sense of the fire of God and the consuming glory of God filled the place. And men and women and young people trembled in the presence of God. God had come down. God had visited his people. God had revived his people. And God awakened communities to a sense of his presence. Oh, that we might know something in our day of a divine visitation, a coming down of the fire and the glory of the presence of the Lord. <coughs> Solomon sacrificed 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. That was serious stuff. He was serious about the business. I wonder how serious are we about the business? How serious are we about God and seeking God? How big is our God? How worthy is our God? What sacrifice am I prepared to make for God? We want our privacy. We want our security. We want our safety. We want our luxury. We want our comfortable lifestyles. We want everything just to suit us. And God to bend his will to our will. And Solomon was so overcome with a sense of who God was that he was prepared to make such an incredible sacrifice as an offering to God. What sacrifice is God looking for? For you and me, he's looking for everything. He's looking for our bodies. He's looking for our homes. He's looking for our wealth. He's looking for us to put everything in the altar. Because anything we've got, we've got from him. And he wants it just to lay it in the altar for him. For God to use whatever we are and whatever we have, just to use it for his glory. God says to him, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your prayer. Verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 7. I've heard your prayer. What an assurance, what a blessing just to know that we've got through to God. I read a wee thing on Facebook, just I think it was last night or maybe this morning. And said it used to be the church prayed through. 
And now the church is through with praying. Eh? Probably the least attended meeting in the churches of our day. It used to be they prayed through and now they're through with praying. And men and women of the past with a burden for God and a burden for soul, they prayed and prayed and prayed until they broke through. And they had that assurance that God had heard. God had heard. If you've never read the stories of Duncan Campbell in the Western Islands, then, then read them and read them and read them again. And the stories of revival across the land and across the world. And at the heart of every revival, of every great awakening of God, there was prayer, praying through to God. And Campbell tells of a time when there was just a hardness about the place. And a young guy, just newly saved, stood up and he says, Father, Father, and the glory of God filled the place. And revival broke out and the place was awakened by God. Oh, that we would know something of these days. But you know, 2 Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 27 doesn't only tell us about the assurance accept of acceptance. It talks about the possibility of, patience, of punishment. God says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, there's dryness, and there's devastation, and there's disease, and there's death. The governmental hand of God and his people. You go into chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles and, uh, and Solomon gives a, a few scenarios to God and he says, if this happens, if this happens, if we pray, will, will, will you hear? And the Lord takes him up in these things and he says, yeah, he says, I will send, I will shut up heaven and there'll be no rain and the locusts will devour. I, and he says, I'll send pestilence into the land. I will do it. I wonder, I wonder at times, are we a people in this nation that is under the governmental hand of God? Is there no times when you bemoan the dryness in your soul and the dryness in our services? A time when there just seems to be, there just seems to be death all around. We can almost smell the smell of death. Spiritual death. And could it be that God has put his hand upon us in judgment and discipline? Why would he do that? Just to bring us to a point when we just cry out to him. Because he gives us an assurance of acceptance. Yeah, there's the possibility of punishment, but you know there's there's that route to recovery. There's a route to recovery. And God's intervention and discipline should lead man to, to lead to man's intercession for recovery and blessing. God says, if, if, if my people respond the way I'm asking them to respond, then he says, then I'll open heavens, then I, then I will heal, then I will forgive. You know, there's a way back, isn't there? You know, God's not finished. God's not finished with our nation. God's not finished with our assemblies. God's not finished with our communities. Praise God. God's not finished with me. And God's not finished with you. There's a way back. We might be feeling dry this, this morning. We might be feeling barren. We might feel as if we're just spiritually diseased and dying. But listen, God's not finished. There's a way back. But there's conditions for the way back, isn't there? If my people. It's good to know we are his people. There's a dignity about that, isn't there? You know, we've got nothing to be ashamed about in this world. I know the world would try to make us ashamed. The world would try to bring us down. Think of the, the guy that just got the, the job in the, the BBC, with the, the, the early morning presenter, and he was getting mocked because of his faith. 
And the world wants to make us ashamed of God, ashamed of Christ, ashamed of the gospel. But we've no need to be ashamed. We're God's people. Let us stand in the dignity of that. And he says, if my people who are called by my name, that's our responsibility. That's our responsibility. You know, we're bearers of the name of God. Remember the words of the Lord to, 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 to Saul of Tarsus. You know, I have chosen you to, to bear my name. Bear my name. Wherever you go, you're carrying my name. We're carrying the name of God in this society. Let's be unashamed of that. Let's stand in the dignity of that. But let's take on board the responsibility of that, that we are bearers of the name of God. And he says, if my people humble themselves, a call to humility, a sense of unworthiness, sense of unworthiness. They're really, they're really admitting the failed they're coming before God with a sense of brokenness, a sense of need. They're humbled. A lot of pride about us, isn't it? A lot of pride about us. Proud of our knowledge and we're proud of our gift and we're proud of our buildings and we're proud of our heritage. Just like the Pharisees. Is it a little wonder that God doesn't hear us? What does God respond to? God responds to, 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 to the humble. To this man will I look, he says in Isaiah 66. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. God is looking for, God is looking for humble spirits. It's the first step in the road back. It's the first step to the road to revival. It is the spirit of humility. Not only is there a call to humility, there's a call to prayer. That's a sense of helplessness. <laughs> That's a sense of helplessness. You know, we don't pray when we've, we don't pray when we think we've got a handle on everything. That's why we don't pray. Because if we think we've got a handle on everything, we think we'll get the answers. Is that not right? We think we can handle everything on our own, and it's only when we realize that we can that we start to pray. God's looking for a sense of a sense of unworthiness within our souls. And he's looking for a sense of absolute helplessness. That we're just coming to God and we're laying hold upon God and we're saying, God, I can't, but you can. I'm finished. I'm dry. But Lord, there's, there's showers of rain in you. There's a reservoir of blessings in you. There's all the resources that I need and it's all in you. And I come to you in prayer and all my helplessness. But not only was there a call to humility and a call to prayer, but there was a call to seek out of a sense of emptiness, a yearning for God. A yearning for God. You so often, well, there's a wee song, a hymn that was written by A.B. Simpson. And it says, you know, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. <laughs> Just a yearning for Him. That's even, that's better than yearning for the blessings. You know, I remember a time in my life, and I say this to my shame, but... There was a time when there was a group of us, we used to meet regularly and we used to, we used to seek the Lord. We used to just lose ourselves in his presence and know the reality of his touch in our lives in an amazing way. And then we started to pray for, pray for his blessing. And we get caught up with revival. And that became the big thing in our life. And we really lost sight on the one, the only one that could send revival. And that was God. You see, if we're seeking God, everything else will just fit into place. He'll give us all that he wants to give us. If we're just seeking him, if we've just got that desire just to know him. That was the passion of Paul, wasn't it? Oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, been made conformable unto his death. God says, listen, you need to humble yourself. If you want, if you're going to experience that, that, that royal route to revival, then he says, you'll need to humble yourself. 
You'll need to pray. You'll need to, you'll need to, you'll need to seek my face. And he says, you'll need to repent. A sense of sinfulness. You need to repent. You need to admit that the problems are ours. Not just that we are bearing them, but that we brought them. Brought them on ourselves. You see, we're so quick, aren't we, just to, to pass the buck. We're so easy to look for excuses instead of just coming before God and just holding up our hands and saying, Father, I have sinned. Father, we have sinned. And we accept responsibility for our own dryness and our own barrenness and our own emptiness. It's because we have sinned. And God says, listen, if my people who are called by my name, he said, you know, he says, if they humble themselves, if they pray, if they seek my face, if they turn from their wicked ways, then, then, Here's a promise. Here's a promise. God can't go back in his promises. If God fails to keep his promise, then he's no God. And if he's no God, then I don't really want anything to do with him. But he's a God that keeps his promises. He's the Almighty. And he says, listen, he says, if you... If you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek my face, if you turn away from all your wicked ways, then he says, I will hear. He says, I will forgive. I will heal your land. We need forgiveness. And we need healing. We need healing in our own spirits. We need healing in our homes. We need healing in our churches. We need healing in our communities. We need healing in our nation. Here's the royal route to recovery, restoration, revival. Hum humbling ourselves, praying, seeking the face of God, turning away from all our wicked ways and God promises that he'll hear, he'll forgive, and he will heal. Let us, not only today, but let us for the rest of our lives prove God to be true. Thanks.